we have been talking about prayer, and many times we say, so how do I pray? And we have learned how great it is that we can learn about prayer through the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are many things through this time that we have grown in prayer. Now, we're talking today about one prayer that perhaps is not too popular, and it is about learning to pray about forgiveness. Now, is anyone here needed one day in your life to apply forgiveness to somebody? And when you did that, you said, piece of cake, bring it on, let's do it again. No, right? Unless you have some sort of weird situation in your life. But, you know, forgiveness is very hard. It's very difficult. And uh, some of you guys, probably the very first time that you needed to forgive a person was probably till you were really an adult and mature person. In my case, it didn't happen like that. I have shared, I think, with you before that I think the very first place where I needed to apply forgiveness was when I was in fourth grade. This is me in fourth grade, the one in red. Now, let me clarify something that before, Jung Sung is laughing. You're laughing at me, Jung Sung. I saw you. Uh, let me clarify. In Mexico, don't go and say, Mexican children going jammies to school because then this creepy thing happens. But no. You know, that is a special play. As you can see, we're in a Christmas celebration, and we supposedly were dancing uh, a song about how Santa Claus was coming to town or something, and I am dancing there with my friends. You know, so I remember it was fourth grade, and there were several things in my life that were going on. As I have shared with you, I had a sister who had some disabilities. In a season of life where people with disabilities were not treated as they are right now, I mean, usually instead of let's support the person on disabilities, it was the point of everybody's jokes. The, do you know what I'm talking about? It was horrible. So my sister suffered a lot from that. And I was becoming more aware of it at that point. The other situation that I had too is that um, I never felt like a beautiful girl or anything. I mean, I was looking forward one day to have this long, beautiful hair. And as you can see, my hair never went there. I mean, I just got very few. And it just makes me feel, my, my family were starting to really hit poverty a little bit harder. And my dad was making a big effort to keep us in this bilingual school. So it was a lot going on in my life. And um, for my age, you know, for my, my, my life in that season. And um, in the midst of that, I was challenged by having an English teacher that I just did not get along with her. Uh, I sense that this teacher was noticing the needs of my sister and in an intention of trying to balance and the way she did it, as, I mean, that's how I saw it, is she was very overprotective with my sister uh, at school, but she was kind of reacting against me in many ways. So I always felt like, you just don't like me. That's what I felt at that point. And uh, there were certain things she did in class that made me feel like that. I remember one time we were doing some sort of art craft thing and I didn't have all the things that were necessary. And she just went ahead and shouted to the class like, oh, she doesn't have all her stuff, you know, so can somebody share with her because she doesn't have anything. And, you know, for a fourth grader girl, that just you're just making me be very obvious in there. And one of the things that really became even a place of tension is um, this teacher will bring her kindergarten son to class before her, his time to go to his classroom. And the son was a kindergarten child. You know, he will walk around, jump around all the time. And uh, one time we were doing the equivalent of the STAR test in, in, in school. And I was doing my test, and this, and this little boy came and took a pen and scrubbed on my test. And uh, the teacher didn't see that. So when she comes and looks at my test with all that uh, writing in there, she just starts shouting it to me. I mean, she just lost it, and she starts shouting, like, what are you doing? Look at you. Look, at, you are not taking this seriously. You are so, I mean, she just kept shouting to me. Now, the problem I had at that age is, I wasn't the kind of child that I'm just going to be quiet and submit. That was my problem. So what happened is I heard to her, and then I spoke, not shouting, but loudly and clear. And I said, this was done by your son. If your son was in the place where he should be, and that's in his kindergarten class, this won't be happening. Now, of course, she didn't say, oh, that's true. Let me do that, right? 
just like, let's, it was, let's just hate each other another level, right? So that was just one example. I can give you several where we're like, okay, we're just hitting it in the wrong way every time that we're trying to interact. So with that situation, my anger against her grew bigger than my size. <laughs> I was angry and bitter about her. Going back home every day after class was this crying and shouting in my house of saying, I am just feeling overwhelmed with this lady. I hate her. I can handle her, you know. And um, in the midst of that, God in his mercy provide what I will almost say an angel in my life. And this is uh, Vicky Romero, who's a missionary. And this missionary, her daughter and I were in the same class. And so she was very aware of what was happening to me. And she came to my house. And I will never forget that from her. This is an adult coming to spend time with me as a fourth grader. And she says, I just came to talk to you about what's going on with your situation with your teacher. And she says, I am aware that she hasn't been doing right to you. I'm aware that there are situations where you are right and she is wrong but I'm coming here to talk to you about forgiveness. Now, in the moment, let me tell you, I put every single way to justify myself or why I shouldn't forgive this girl, uh, this teacher. And she listened to me very patiently. I'm telling you, several hours she stayed with me. And every time that she would say, Lubina, you need to forgive her, I will come with a yes, but look what she did. Or yes, but this is what happened. And yes, but, and she told me, Lupina, we can go all day with this yes, but, and you're right. I'm not telling you that what she's doing is right or wrong. I'm telling you, regardless of that, for your sake, you need to forgive. What she was trying to make me understand is the concept of forgiveness. Forgiveness, it says, is a process in which we bring our pain to God for healing and allow God's grace to be demonstrated through us. He, she was trying to free me from that bitterness. And she was doing it in the right time of my life. I think if she hasn't come and really confront me with that, I will become a person who doesn't know how to take out from my heart that bitterness. And forgiveness is not easy. It's a difficult process, and sometimes we confuse what it is. I value a lot uh, Dr. Toddy Holman, who's one of our professors in Asbury, who explains very well what's forgiveness and what's not. What I like is what she's saying about what is not. First of all, forgiveness is not an emotion. You will never say, I just feel like forgiving people. Have you ever felt like that? Ah, you know, I just feel so happy forgiving people. If you do that, talk to me at the end of worship because you're kind of a weirdo and I want to learn from you. Because never, you never feel like, oh, yes, let's do this again. And no, you don't. The other thing is forgiveness is not an immediate reaction. It's not like, okay, right now it's on, then off, and that's it. And now in three minutes I'm done and I can keep going in my life. It's not that. It's a process. Part of the process brings that healing too. The other thing is also, and it's important to recognize, is not the same of repentance. This was like an eye-opening for me too. What it means is this. There are times that you're going to be called to forgive a person regardless of what the person is in relationship with you. Many times I have heard this statement. I am not going to give forgiveness until that person comes and asks me for forgiveness. You know, you don't know that. You can't control the other person. You wish that there is maturity in the other person, but you don't know. Like in my case with the teacher, I don't even know if she was aware of how I was interpreting her actions toward me. That cannot stop you. That would be very painful if we need to wait till everyone who has hurt you come and ask you for forgiveness to be able for you to forgive. You wish it, but it's not always possible. So don't expect the repentance of the other person and then you forgive. Then you're still conditioned of the other person's behavior with you. That means the other person still has power over your life. So you need just to go ahead and say, God, I'm going to forgive the person regardless of the, the person being repented or not. Also important is not condoning a wrong done to you. Forgiveness is not that. 
It's not thinking that, oh, you know, now because you are forgiving, then just forget about that and everything is clean and the other person is not going to see a consequence of their actions. Remember the Old Testament. Every time that we read what's going on with the prophets, the prophets will come and confront people with the reality of their lives. You are wrong. You are not following God's will. Therefore, you're going to have consequences. Now you have a God of redemption and reconciliation and restoration who will come to your life and work in that way. But you need to confront what's wrong. So what it means is whoever has hurt you will need to confront that reality. Whatever you have done to, you need to confront that. So it's part of that. The other thing is not excusing something painful. That doesn't mean that it's going to hurt. That doesn't mean that what you're carrying as a consequence of somebody else's sin against you is going to get just suddenly easier. It still hurts. It's going to hurt for a while. It will come a place of healing, but it's not excusing something painful in that. And the other thing that is important is forgiveness does not always bring reconciliation. Because for reconciliation, you need both parties to participate in this desire of forgiveness. And there will be times when you are the only one willing to take that step. We wish that. We wish reconciliation, especially when it's a relationship issue. We wish that both parties said, I want to get to a place where we can say, I'm sorry, both of us. That's what you wish. But you won't always have that capacity. But you still get in that place of saying, I'm taking the responsibility of forgiveness. Does it make sense what it is? Okay. Now, so what is forgiveness? How can we do this? First of all, forgiveness, let me be clear as many things we have been talking in these sermons. This is one of the trademarks of the Christian. In other words, it's almost impossible. I will say it is impossible to apply real forgiveness if you do not have a relationship with Christ. It's, as Christians, it's hard, isn't it? As Christians, and many of you could say, I have been a Christian for the longest time, and it's still hard. It's still difficult. As pastors... It's still difficult, but we can do it. We know it's possible because it's part of the result of our Christian life. So to expect a person to forgive needs to come as if the other person is a Christian. If the other person you need to forgive is not a Christian, guys, it's very difficult to ask them to go there because they don't have the tools to go there. What are those tools? First of all, is what we call about glorifying God. This word, if there is one thing I, remember, I wish you remember from all this sermon series, is the learning and understanding of the word glorify. Glorify has these connections. First of all is we know who is God, and God is in the center of our lives. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The more we know the character of God, the more we know how to relate to God. So we know who he is, and then we can be honest with him. I like that section of saying, you know, God, I'm just going to tell you what I feel. I'm going to tell you where I am right now. I'm going to express to you my emotion. I'm going to express to you my celebration, my frustration. Whatever I am, I'm bringing it to you. But then there is this other part. Then I submit to you, God. It's what we talked just last week. You may your glory, may your will be done. Thy will be done. That's what we pray. So this is to glorify. So how is it that glorify is something that is part of forgiveness? It's because we need to learn part of God's character. And what we learn about our God is that we have a God who applies and gives forgiveness to all of us. Ephesians says, um, chapter 4, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other just as who? God also in Christ forgave you. We are capable, guys, to forgive others because we have received forgiveness. How beautiful is that this mighty, perfect God who could have all the capacity to say, I am not going to forgive you. I'm going to leave you where you are. And nothing happens to him. He chose to take the initiative to come to all of us and to carry in that cross our sins 
our places where we have done wrong, our, those places where somebody else have done wrong against you, those places where you have felt that you are in a deep hole, and he has brought all of that to the cross. And with his love and his power in that cross, he nailed them there. And he looks at you and me to tell us, you are free. And we have the opportunity of a new life. We know what it is to be restored and reconciled. And we know that when we go back to those holes, we know that if we extend our hand, we can feel that mighty God bringing us back and putting us in the right place again. We know what it is to say, I am sorry, I did a mistake, God, but can I come back to you? And what do we find him? We find him receiving us where we are and loving us again. Sometimes we forgive people and we say, I'm going to forgive you, but I don't want to establish a relationship with you anymore. But you realize that God doesn't say that to us. He says, you know, I'm going to forgive you, but I still want to connect with you and walk with you and love you. This is why we can do it. It is until we leave that experience that then we can forgive. And in this forgiveness also is a proactive resetting. The scripture is very clear in what we read today. What does it say? Love everyone who likes tacos like you, Lupina. This is it. Love those who think that Taco Bell is actually a blasphemy. <laughs> That's what it says. It is a blasphemy. Don't tell you, I love you. I love you. I need to forgive you. Really, Herschel? We need to talk. Okay. All right. We'll talk this later. But anyway. Love your what? Enemies. is proactive. Let me tell you a big new. You guys are going to have enemies. Do you know that? You already have some enemies. Just by the fact that you're Christian, that puts you already in that place. We are going to deal with that, but we're proactive. It says love them. Now, how do we do that? It's specifically the scripture that we read. It's very hands-on. It says in here. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. What do we need to do? Do what? Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. It is difficult. But what he's doing in this is, it's a very powerful place. It is an enemy. It's far away from God, let's say. By you praying for the person and blessing. Now, the prayer, guys, is very specific. It's a blessing. It's not, Lord, I hope that in this moment his car will just stop. No. What we are, I mean, David was very clear in his prayer sometimes. He would say, I wish you can just, just punch them in the face and all their teeth will fall off. I mean, you can see in David in the Psalms, he says something like that. But then he, he comes back to submission. This is my feeling, God. But let me submit to what you, your will is done. So it's the same. We can say, you know, I don't really don't wish anything good for my neighbor right now or my enemy. But in this moment, Lord, I bless my enemy. I bless. When you bless your enemy, you are interrupting the work of the devil in that action. Because by that, somehow in that person is going to be a place where they will be open to hear about God's grace. Open to God's love. We don't know the story of all of our enemies, even if it's somebody you live with. You don't know everything. You don't belong in that body of the other person. Just God. And there are times where people will react to you and they don't even know why. But it is not your job to try to figure out the person. It's your job to bless the person. And the other thing that changes is when you are blessing that person, your behavior toward that person changes. Even your way you look at the person. If you're trying to deal with your bitterness, if you take a picture of how you look, and then you take a picture of you when you have blessed your enemy, you will notice the difference in the way you interact with the person. So what is, is about this is like, we are not going to be reactive. We are going to be proactive and praising this moment. God, I'm not probably the most popular cookie in the world right now, but I bless those who are considered enemies in my life. So that you set yourself to a new place. And another important thing is forgiveness is a spirit-led habit. As I said at the beginning, this is not something that is going to come 
just by having a good karma, because that doesn't exist, or having a good desire, because this is going to end. It's about your relationship with God. I like what Andrew Thompson says. The power of forgiveness is rooted in the fact that it is an act of God's love. It is an act of who? God's love. You need that. So forgiveness cancels our sin and then begins to heal us of that sin entirely, all the while enabling us to begin forgiving others. So it is a fruit of that connection with the Spirit, and through that, you can connect in relationship with others. And the last thing, too, is that forgiveness is part of a sanctification process. It means that the more you practice forgiveness, the stronger you get in your faith. One of the things that we learned with John Wesley, he said how important was communion. And for him, he was like, take communion as often as you can, because it is that process where you come and ask for that forgiveness, and you receive that forgiveness. And in that process, you grow in your faith. You are restored. So this is what forgiveness is. So how do we apply it? How do we use it? First of all, I think that the biggest problem about forgiveness is that we need to deal with something. And it's what I call the ruminate syndrome. Have you heard about it? Ruminate syndrome. If you have never heard it as a syndrome, it's because I created that word. Which is that syndrome? Is this one. Now, let me explain you what happened. Maybe none of you have ever had that problem. But the ruminate syndrome is when you are thinking in somebody who hurt you and it comes back. And you're still chewing on it. But every time you're chewing, there is more in the mix. You know, like saying, that sounds super gross, but that's exactly what happened. And like, we're like, okay, that person hurt me. Did you see how, how he looked at me? I saw how he looked at me. And now that I'm thinking, I realized, and he was wearing a red hat, and he knows how I hurt, hate red. And I'm sure he did it on purpose. So next time that I see that person, I'm going to say, ah, you think you look cute with your hat? Let me tell you what I'm thinking. I mean, you just keep growing and growing this anger. You see what I'm saying? And you just keep chewing on it and chewing on it, and it keeps growing and growing. And then when you are connected with that person, your brain has been using so much time in this anger that you don't realize how much it has shaped your entire day and then your entire week and then your entire life on that sense. So how do we deal with that? Very clearly, Dr. Tori Holman tells us three things. You need to learn to give up. You need to learn to give out, and you need to learn to hold out. What do we give up? We give up negative emotions. The scripture says in Colossians 3 very clearly, but now you must also what? Rid yourselves of all such things as these anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. What it means is that don't carry all those stones in your heart. It does not say just put them down. Because if you do that, they're going to come up later and explode. It means get rid of them. And this is what you do in that prayer. God, I confess to you I'm angry. I confess to you I'm hurt. I'm scared. I, I feel overwhelmed. You confess what you feel. And you say, God, I'm getting rid of them. I'm asking you, please, Lord, heal me from these feelings so I can interact with this person as I need to. Then the next thing is this. It's not just emptying your heart. It's also what are you going to put back on it? And the scripture says we need to, pos to put positive emotions. <clears throat> and those are in Colossians 3. It says... Therefore, as God's chosen people, meaning as children of God, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if, you, if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. In other words, say, God, I'm getting, asking you to help me be free of this horrible emotions but I ask you give me compassion give me kindness give me a heart of forgiveness 
Give me a heart that can actually say to that person, I forgive you regardless of how you re react to me. So give me that and fill me with that. And then what we do is we hold out to a promise. And the promise that God gives to all of us is in Colossians 3, 2. And he says, and over all these virtues, put on what? Love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. So it's about emptying your heart of those things that get in the way, giving to your heart the opportunity to be filled with kindness and love and compassion. But you are able to do that knowing that perhaps right now you don't feel it or you don't experience it, but knowing that the peace of God will come back. That's the hope that we have as Christians. The peace of God will come back. You know this? Every time that we apply forgiveness, a curse is broken. And I pray that today, where you are, may we all together break as many curses as we have carried so we can live a life that is full of that joy joy and peace that God gives to all of us. So let's pray.